Hi everybody, uh, well I'm Paul Green from uh, this uh, odd new company called Iotic Labs and um, this is the opportunity to, uh, after the last talk, to scare you <laughs> because I'm going to talk about uh, how we might think about things differently in this internet of things and think about sharing stuff with each other. Um, but just to reassure Robert, we have actually thought about this at board level <laughs> and have had some conversations very early on and actually spent a lot of time working out some technological frameworks to provide security elements associated with that. Uh, but I don't want to get bogged down in that aspect of it uh, right now because otherwise you'll kind of miss the point, I think, about it. So I, I was thinking about actually how, how we might imagine our future. What, what do we think about when we're imagining the future of this Internet of Things? Are you thinking about something like this? You know, we, we've all seen the films, haven't we? Um, you know, the things like Blade Runner and, 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 of course, those great things like, you know, Minority Report and stuff like that. Well, they all sort of showed this picture of this kind of dystopian future. Whereas our kind of these, these technology things are all going to join up and uh, create sort of infrastructure that was going to be challenging, exciting in some ways, but worrying in others, and makes a great movie. Um, but the thing that was interesting about them is that you see so many people who are trying to develop their products or services somehow based upon what they saw in a film 20 years ago. And you think, is that what we really want? Surely we've got more imagination than that. Because actually the world's moved on and we've got something different now. So are we actually looking for a kind of retro future? Or are we listening also to that corporate hype that we get from so many of the comms companies that are telling us about all this connected stuff? Or is it going to be like that? I'm sure you've all seen these cartoons. <laughs> you know this idea that somehow my connected home is going to be brighter than me and it's going to start changing my life and you know, that's all going to be very exciting. What's going to happen? What's this going to look like? And how are we involved in it? Well, we all know that, you know, how exciting our government's got excited about this. I mean, uh, you know, here, here is our wonderful Prime Minister and uh, talking to the wonderful Chancellor. Uh, in Germany, saying uh, this, this whole Internet of Things is going to combine the amazing industrial creativity of Germany attached to the creative imagination of the United Kingdom. And as some wag said, well, that means to say that the Germans are going to make everything and we're going to do the website. <laughs> so I really hope that it's actually going to be more than that. Because actually, what's it going to be? Well, they said that it's going to be kind of bigger than humanity. Great, lots of disparate activity, lots of unexpected innovation because that's what the Industrial Revolution was like. They said it's going to be like that. So what was the Industrial Revolution like? What was that going to do for us? How was that going to look? And actually the big problem is, is that we can't quite imagine this because did anybody plan the Industrial Revolution? Did it come out of some great big vision that people had? Was it all worked out as a whole load of interconnected standards that are all operated? Or did it kind of just start happening? I mean, is this disruptive change that we're going to be anticipating right now going to be like this M2M thing, but completely different? You know, it's going to look like something we've seen before, but actually it's not going to be like it at all. And actually I've got some pictures of Industrial Revolution stuff here, and I thought, did anybody see anything that connects all those together? You know, there's over here, there's salt, and over here there's a blast furnace producing the, you know, the early sort of iron and steel. Over there there's a sort of pottery kilns, and over here we've got a lime kiln. Any connections? All Industrial Revolution stuff, all started about the same time. No. Great, I love it, because nobody ever gets connections to these things. Because the great thing is they don't look as though they're connected, yet somehow they all stimulated each other. Because the iron and steel industry needed limestone and slate lime in order to be able to produce the high quality iron that it was wanting. Once you started producing slate lime and you produced salt as you did when you started mining it all over the place, you then suddenly joined salt with the limestone and you got the chemical industry developed. The chemical industry produced soap, which was lovely, because soap enabled you to get to give things a soap product to people who were living in the cities and in the factories because the problem was, is you had lots of people living together, they were sort of dying of all sorts of diseases. They didn't live long enough to support the factories. So therefore, actually having something that enabled them to stay clean was helpful, and it was even better when they could start eating off plates that were produced, rather than using the, um, uh, the wooden boards that they were using up until that time. The trouble was, they couldn't get the plates to the big cities, because the roads were so bad, and very fortunately, the uncle of the people that were producing the plates 
which was Wedgwood, was also very good at digging holes in a straight line and making canals so you could get them there without them breaking. Did anybody really plan that? No. Did all these businesses rely upon each other? Absolutely. And did they all start generating new things in a way that we wouldn't expect? Because this is about stuff that we're talking about that's going on that we don't imagine. And what I always wanted to think about is the Industrial Revolution. What did it do for us? It made it so I didn't have to use my muscles anymore. Good news for me. What does the internet do for us? I don't have to remember anything anymore. So what's the internet of things going to do with us if the next revolution, what's that going to do? Well, I'm going to say it's going to enable us to not have to say, you know, to be able to augment our senses with things that we've never been able to fully sense before on a much wider basis. To be able to integrate things we never imagined. And so we want to be able to put stuff somehow into the internet and then connect it somehow to other stuff and more stuff and somehow be able to link all of that stuff together. It's just like it is. This is how it is. We do that all the time. We don't even think about it. We do it by coming into a room like this and having conversations with each other. But when we start talking about doing it on a broader basis, we have to think some more about that. Because when we move from this linear world that we've all been happily working in, we have to start thinking about our mindset. Because when you go to the Internet of Things, if it's truly going to be like the Internet, it involves a mindset change. It goes from being highly organised to something that's much more organic. And we go from something that's use case led, which tends to lead you to those big silos of data, to being user led. And I don't know if you're anything like me, but when you see large organisations that have implemented those systems where their communications goes into an enormous big bucket over here, They've just got it complete. They've just started getting the outputs that they defined two years earlier to all of those database engineers and said, that's what I want. But now two years has gone on, do they still want it? Chances are they're asking a slightly different question now to the one they're asking two years ago. And it doesn't quite do what they wanted it to do. And they've thought of a lot more things that they really want to do with this data than they'd actually originally planned. Consequently, we run into a massive problems when we start talking about big data silos and a lot of the big data systems. Because frequently, we want to be able to explore rather than have to explain everything. We want to be able to look underneath the covers and see what's really going on. So I'm asking you to kind of open your minds to this right now. And just imagine you had something really boring, like you've gone down to a local I don't know, one of your do-it-yourself shops and bought a garden sprinkler. So this is the kind of crazy thing you want to do. Controls water flow, and it's got a little timer on it. Really boring, okay? And you ought to be able to get that for home and go www.mystuff.com and find the thing and actually connect it up to your phone. Okay, we're all happy with that. Yep. You, you want to do that, we think that's pretty straightforward. So you get it and you've got your little app there and you kind of take it home and during the first week you remember to turn your sprinkler on and off in your garden to water your plants. And, um, but then of course after a week you start forgetting about it because it's not a new toy anymore and you can't show it to anybody. And um, so therefore it starts coming on when it's raining. Which is a real pain because you don't want to be using your water when it's raining. And so wouldn't it be nice if you could join this up to you know, weather, you know, weather forecast of some sort. Yeah, fine. That ought to work quite well. The only trouble is that weather forecasts are not always that accurate and it may not be local enough for you. So what you'd really like to do, wouldn't it be nice if you could find some little local weather station that was nearby? Maybe your neighbours have got one where they're willing to publish the data, which just simply tells you whether it's raining or not. Not horribly personal, that in my garden, but it isn't really that worrying. So maybe I could join that into some kind of what we're calling an IOTIC space, an Internet of Things space, where you can take a real thing and make a kind of virtual version of it, join it with other stuff, and interact to give you more meaningful information. You can mash this data together to create something that says, this is what's going on, let's make some sense of it. Sounds okay? 
Wouldn't it be nice if you had some university around that had a horticultural department and they had a professor of strange begonias that you happen to be growing in your garden? And you think it'd be really nice if I could look after my strange begonias. I don't know, I don't grow begonias. But, um, you know, something in your garden that you really liked, it was precious to you. Maybe they could offer a service into that space. And therefore, you've now created a kind of new ecosystem of people producing new services that they can sell to you in a practical way in your own environment simply by sharing some tiny pieces of data with each other. Suddenly, you've got little mash apps that produce new things. And of course, I'm sure your water utility will spot this and say, hey, look at that. If you give me sort of information about when you're using your water, I might give you something off your water bill. Yummy. So that can be quite fun. Wouldn't it be nice if we could create a space that worked like that? So we set about doing exactly that. And um, we made it so that it would work with some permissions and some ideas and, and started building it. And uh, we had an unexpected outcome, which was um, one of the big railway operators, in fact, Network Rail themselves, came along to us and said, that's really interesting. We'd have found something like that um, quite useful because actually we look after infrastructure, but there's loads of other people that contribute to running our railway. You know, people who look after the track, uh, people who look after the, you know, we own the track, but people who look after the ballast and the services and the support. And you may remember they had a bit of a problem with flooding a couple of years ago. Do you remember that? And uh, the problem was is that they wanted to pick up information about where the water was getting deeper. If it's getting deeper, you can send people there with sandbags and you build a little wall. The only trouble is they didn't know where it was. Snag. So we said, let's see if we might be able to do something about that in this space and just make this work. And they said, well, we did this and we put all the data into a huge database because we managed to get it from some of the water companies and did it. So how long did that take? Oh, it took us nine months. So was, did you still have the problem then? Well, no, it had gone away. Were you able to predict that you were going to have that problem? No, of course not. So we took a little area of, uh, this is a waterway around the north of Cambridgeshire, funnily enough, where Henry VIII originally dug his canals. <laughs> and uh, we found that, believe it or not, the Environment Agency were publishing data, free. And it told you what it was never was. It just tells you what it is now. It doesn't put it into a big database. It doesn't store it anywhere. It just tells you. So how easy would it be to put a little mash app together to, you know, to see whether the water level is deeper or not and share that data and maybe link it with some other things? And lo and behold, there was a little weather station over here publishing data about what the weather was doing. Handy, huh? So we were able to join that together and this was a kind of structure that happened kind of on its own. I won't go into all the boring details of all this, but the point was is that it started providing the data in a very simple way that was live and said, hey, here it is now. Isn't that handy? And it was exactly what they needed. It took us 48 hours to do that. Really simple. So how can you do this? Well, I'll try to create a little community picture of stuff that you might know about. And as we're here in, in uh, this sort of central part of Scotland, I thought I'd put Freescale in here because, you know, some of you, I think, from Freescale or know these guys um, just over there in Glasgow. And, um, you know, they're doing some great stuff with joining things up. And we joined this up with, you know, with the guys at Arm and, you know, various other microcontroller manufacturers and Bluetooth, low energy and all that kind of stuff. So there are lots and lots of sources of data that are kind of electronics. Although, bearing in mind that I've already said that the thing can be anything. So we'll come to that in a moment. And we say, okay, can you put that into an ionic space? Well, yes, you can. Um, but what you also do is you bring the application and the user environment also into this space so that you're in a common space. It isn't a very sophisticated one, but ideally you want to have some kind of search and discovery function that's going on with that and some big data engines around the outside. But the key thing is here, oops, I'm sorry, I've lost a key component off my picture. Can I go back? I don't know how to go back on your machine. <laughs> Can I just go back? There you go. No? No, I to click on, click on it and then click on the... Uh, then right. go back. Oh, okay. Yeah, we've lost the key component on here. For some reason or another, a piece has run off this thing, which is a bit of a nuisance, which is there's a, there's a function that sits over the top here, which you're going to have to imagine, I'm afraid, which is called a registry. And the registry has a key function here. It's because it contains all of those exciting little 
security components and security permissions and accesses that are important for the device. And one of the things that we do that's rather sneaky is that when something communicates, there's two components to something saying I'm a thing. There's the actual thing itself, which has, like you, it has an identity. It's got a personality. It's got some history. It's got something about it that tells you who it is, where it lives, and how it behaves. But then there's the actual words you're using and the pieces you're communicating. And we're going to separate those two things out. So if it's a thermometer, for example, a temperature gauge, the temperature gauge says, I'm a temperature gauge of 36 the High Street, and this is what I do, this is how I behave. That information is held by the registry and is not put in the space. When we share things, we share the data into the space. But that data, if somebody's going to attack it or just get hold of that information, is actually meaningless without actually having the knowledge of what it means, about the context of who it's from, who's saying it, what that's about, how it reacts and how it behaves. And that is where the search function comes in, because the search function enables you to find things when you're looking at the register, when you're looking at the nature of what that beast is. And that's the piece that overcomes the challenges of security and also of the type of data, the standards that you're using. So the thing is going to easily come into the space and share it and contribute to the picture. But also in this space, you have the advantage that big data engines can sit here and actually contribute to it as well. They contribute to the overall picture of the world and help you create a better understanding of it. And it means to say also that because all of the, the users or other, other environments are also able to come into this kind of common area, it can, be, it can accommodate something as, as simple as maybe your highlighting on Kindle could be the most basic version of your thing that appears in that space. So that's our concept. We set about building it. And amazingly, we've got all kinds of people who've become quite excited about the idea that you can have interactions on the fly that are not predetermined, but they enable some creative outputs to come about. And I'll just tell you one other crazy railway story. We've got lots and lots of stories about people using this. Everything from the London College of Fashion is doing a project which is, can my dress talk to me? As people walk down the street, it can pick up sensors and information around it and change its color and its properties. That's really useful if you're in a kind of industrial environment and you want to change the way your clothing behaves. Your clothing can interact with you without you having to use a flat screen. That's even more exciting. Uh, we've got a, a medical innovation center working with us at the moment who are actually building, to get, building projects for people in a you know, home care environment. We're working with several councils on major systems around their integrating data across various departments. And uh, to give you one crazy example, here's, a, here's an example from a local railway operator. It's a train company on my own local line. It runs four coach trains and they have one toilet in them. That's a bit of a snag, as you can imagine. And it's also a very new train, or relatively new train, made by Siemens, who are great at making trains, but I think they're a little bit challenged on the toilet front. And the, the interesting thing about it is, unlike the other trains on the line, it actually has a tank underneath, so that the waste actually is more environmentally held in this train. The only trouble is, of course, is that when the tank gets full, what happens? Locks the doors. And as the train journey can be a couple of hours long, that's quite a nasty problem because every so often you find people very distressed at their final railway station because they've been on this train for two hours without being able to go to the loo. Now, interestingly, who knows when this toilet is full? Guess. Okay, I'm going to tell you. There's a little light that comes on in the cab. So the driver knows. That's really good. Guess who else knows? Siemens knows in Germany. That's really good because they've got a lovely end-to-end -end monitoring system that picks up all the information about the train and it puts it into a big database and they've got a massive list of every single train all the times that these toilets are actually blocked up. Fantastic. Big data. Isn't it wonderful? Doesn't it tell you so much? Does anybody know where to park the train so that they can empty the toilets? No. If they don't place, place the train at the right place at night to empty the toilets, the toilet can remain blocked up for a week. Good, huh? Wouldn't it be nice if you could share one bit, because that's all it is, one bit of data, 
with the community that looks after trains. Wouldn't our lives be nicer? Wouldn't it contribute in a very easy way to improving the way that we live our lives? And so what we've tried to do, and what I think we've pretty well created now, is an IOTIC space which is search agnostic, transport agnostic, and technology agnostic, because pretty well anything can come into this space. It's great to be found in this space, um, and it's great to interact. That's what this is actually all about. And what you do as a result of that interaction is you create a community of internet they like things, who like working and sharing together. That's more about how we live, and how we might live our lives, how we might live as a business, how we might operate as organisations together. So if you want to have a chat about that and what we might do with it, come and have a chat. I'd love to talk to you, and please don't get me really bogged down in all the security questions, but they are, they are in our minds and they are in the protocols. So I'd love to talk to you about that sometime and see how it might join up and benefit your community. Thank you.